In this video, we're going to talk about everything that you want to and need to know about herniated discs. This might be one of the spinal topics with the most misconceptions out there. So I'm excited to help dispel some of the myths and the misinformation, and hopefully to provide you with some clarity about what a herniated disc is, what sorts of symptoms that it can and cannot cause, and what can and should be done about a herniated disc, both non-surgically as well as potentially surgically. Hello, I'm Dr. Grant Cooper, the co-founder and the co-director of Princeton Spine and Joint Center. Let's start by talking about what the disc actually is. The intervertebral disc sits between the vertebral bones in your spine, and it provides the cushioning so that the bones aren't rubbing on each other. The disc itself is made up of an inner jelly, and that's called the nucleus propulsus, and an outer crust called the annulus fibrosus. Now, the jelly gives the disc its cushioning effect. The jelly itself is actually made in part of inflammatory proteins like interleukin-1, TNF-alpha. Inflammatory proteins, mind you, are called inflammatory proteins because they're proteins that when they get next to nerves, they cause inflammation, and it's inflammation that causes pain. Now, there are no nerve endings in the middle of the disc, so it's all fine. You can't have pain without the nerve endings. But in the outer third of the annulus fibrosis, there are nerve endings. When discs cause back pain, it's actually not a herniation that causes the back or the neck pain, but rather if a disc is going to cause back or neck pain, it's because there's a tear inside the disc that extends from the jelly in the disc, in the nucleus propulsus, to the outer third of the annulus fibrosis where those nerve endings exist. And then any activity or position that tends to put more pressure on the disc will exacerbate the pain. So for example, for a lower back, sitting and bending forward tends to put more pressure on the disc, which in turn irritates the tear and the nerve endings. A herniated disc is when the disc actually moves or herniates in relation to the bones in the spine. When a disc herniates, it can come in close proximity to the nerve roots exiting the spine. And when this happens, the most common symptoms include radiating arm or leg pain, numbness, tingling, the pain from a herniated disc is generally sharp or burning in character. Sometimes the patient can even have weakness in the muscles that are being innervated by the involved nerve root. Importantly, people often describe sciatic pain coming from a herniated disc as a pinched nerve. Now, a pinched nerve is a fine description, but it's important to realize that most people with these symptoms don't actually have a mechanically compressed nerve. In fact, mechanical compression of a nerve will generally result in profound weakness and require relatively urgent, if not emergent, surgical intervention. Mechanical compression of the nerve is very unusual, but what actually happens is the disc comes close to the nerve and the nerve then becomes inflamed. Now, one of the things that predisposes to, to this is the nature of the disc. Discs, as we said, are full of inflammatory proteins. And so if these proteins get next to nerves, it'll exacerbate the inflammation around the nerve. This is what leads to the counterintuitive fact that someone can have a small herniated disc but have horrendous pain. Another person could have a huge herniated disc and have relatively little or even no symptoms. Now again, this is because it's really the inflammatory reaction that's either going to cause the pain and the other symptoms or not. This is also the reason for that often quoted statistic that about 25 to 30% of the general population have herniated discs and have no symptoms. It's important to recognize that just because some people have herniated discs and have no symptoms doesn't mean that herniated discs don't cause symptoms ever. In fact, some herniated discs are extremely problematic. When someone has back pain and radiating leg pain, it generally means that there's an annular tear on the inside of the disc and also a disc herniation. I can't tell you how often I've seen patients with a relatively normal MRI of the lumbar spine who are so frustrated because they thought they had back pain from a disc, but the MRI was essentially normal and there was no herniated disc. When there's an annular tear in the disc, you're only going to see that on MRI about 30% of the time. This is because an MRI is taking very thin slices through the spine, but the tear is extremely thin. So on any given pass through the disc with the MRI, it may or may not catch the tear. And in fact, the MRI is going to miss a tear about 70% of the time. Now, when you have a symptomatic herniated disc, 
you most often can get the symptoms and the underlying problem better without surgery. This is done by eliminating the inflammation and then learning and doing exercises to unload the spine so the same stresses aren't going through the same part of the spine so that the inflammation doesn't return. Now, how do you get the inflammation better? Well, first, let's make an analogy. Inflammation is like a fire. There are two ways that you can put out a fire. One is to move away the sticks and let the fire burn itself out. In a surgical world, that means literally taking out the disc. In the non-surgical world, that means stretching and strengthening the muscles around the spine to unload the disc so the disc can essentially rest and heal. Does that work? Well, yes, sometimes. See, the spine is like a mast on a ship. Now, a mast on a ship has riggings that attach to it to unload the mast so the mast doesn't just fall over. See, the mast can't support its own weight without those riggings. And the same is true with the spine. The human spine, if you take it out of the body and you put it on the ground, the spine can support about 35 pounds of axial pressure before things start to break. Now, no matter how small you may or may not be, I'm sure you weigh more than 35 pounds. So all of us have to rely on the muscles that attach to the spine to unload the spine. This isn't just a question of being stronger. I remember a defensive linebacker for the Eagles I took care of. The guy was huge. He was huge and he was strong and he had basically six-pack abs. He could do hundreds of sit-ups but he had a herniated disc that was very symptomatic. Now, I wanted to send him to physical therapy, and when I said that, he looked at me like I had two heads. After all, he was incredibly strong, and he was also very flexible, which is kind of rare. But I showed him a very basic therapy exercise where you have to do a pelvic tilt, and then you do toe taps. The point is that it's not an exercise that demands a tremendous amount of strength, but you do have to be able to engage your lower abs in synchrony with moving your pelvis. Any Pilates instructor would be able to do this easily. But this mountain of a man, he just couldn't do it. Now, of course, he's going to pick that up very quickly in therapy. And he did pick it up, and it made a huge difference for him when he did. But the point is just that it's not just about being strong, but about being strong in the right way and integrating the muscles with the pelvis as well as the rest of your muscles. Now, that said, sometimes you do a great job of clearing away the sticks with the exercise but that fire just keeps on wanting to burn all the same. When that happens, you need to throw water on the fire. In this case, the water is a targeted injection under x-ray or fluoroscopic guidance. The trouble with oral anti-inflammatory medications is that only about 2% of what you take by mouth is going to make it to the spine. So NSAIDs like ibuprofen and naproxen, they may make you feel better, but you're not going to get enough anti-inflammatory medication to the actual site of inflammation to make a real difference. Oral steroids can be temporarily effective, but even there, you're getting such a small amount of the medicine to the site of inflammation that the effects are usually relatively short-lived. By contrast, a targeted injection can take a fraction of the medication, deliver it directly to the site of inflammation. The most common way of doing this is something called a transforaminal epidural steroid injection where a needle is placed next to the nerve root under x-ray guidance, and a very small dose of steroid is delivered around the nerve root. Transforaminal epidural steroid injections have very good efficacy for taking away the inflammation around the nerve roots when they're being inflamed by a herniated disc. However, then the water turns off. That is to say, if all you do is an epidural steroid injection, the effects tend to last for only a few months. So if you do use an injection to relieve the inflammation, then that injection should always be viewed as a window of opportunity, during which time you can focus on the exercises in order to unload the spine so that when the injection wears off, which it will, the inflammation hopefully doesn't return. Exercises are hit or miss at making inflammation and pain go away, but exercises tend to be extremely effective at keeping inflammation and pain from returning. Now, sometimes conservative care is just not effective. Or the pain is so miserable, you just can't give conservative care a fair chance, even with pain medications. In these instances, a discectomy is the most common surgical procedure to remove a herniated disc. A discectomy is a minimally invasive surgical procedure in which some of the disc is removed. The advantages of this procedure are that the downtime is relatively small, and the procedure is generally very well tolerated. Now, it's important to note that about 5% of disc herniations that undergo a discectomy end up re-herniating, 
So even if you have a discectomy, it's very important to follow through with exercises on the back end of the surgery in order to unload the spine so that the chances of a re-herniation are diminished. Also, there's a question of whether doing even a minimally invasive discectomy in which some of the disc is removed may or may not accelerate the overall arthritic process because you've essentially removed some of the cushioning in the disc. At the end of the day, though, a discectomy is a relatively small surgery and it's an excellent option for recalcitrant disc herniations. It's important to recognize that discectomies are excellent, uh, excellent options for treating radiating leg symptoms, but they're not terribly reliable at alleviating back pain. Sometimes a discectomy cures the leg pain, but it actually causes some back pain. Now, this isn't a deal breaker because if the leg pain is horrible, then trading that for a more mild back pain is usually a good trade. And then that, that back pain can be you know, addressed non-surgically. But it's important to realize what discectomies can and can't treat well. Now, sometimes, even if it's a disc herniation causing the symptoms, if there's a lot of surrounding arthritic changes, the surgeon may feel that taking out the disc may actually work to destabilize the spine. And if this is the case, the surgeon will have to perform a discectomy with a fusion. Now, fusion surgery is one in which the bones and the disc are fused together. This type of surgery can also address back pain if back pain is also present. There are many more problems with a fusion as opposed to a discectomy. Fusions have much longer recovery times. Fusions end up putting more stress above and below the fusion, and that can sometimes lead to something called adjacent level disease. The fusions themselves can develop scar tissue and irritate nerves. At the end of the day, the threshold to have a discectomy should be much lower than the one to have a fusion surgery. And still, sometimes fusions are necessary and excellent to do. It's just important to talk with your doctor about all the pros and cons of each of these surgical procedures, well, as well as any procedure. Now, the last point I'd like to make about surgery here is that if surgery is needed, then the stronger you go into a surgery, the stronger and the quicker you'll come out of it. A lot of times, if someone is going to go in for any type of spinal surgery, they stop moving and they stop doing any rehab exercises because they figure they'll just wait until their back is, you know, fixed. And this is invariably a mistake because the muscles that you'll need after the surgery become weaker and more atrophied before the surgery. So even if you're going to go for surgery, maybe especially if you're going to go for surgery, the more you can work with a physical therapist on structured exercises for you to get stronger and more ready for the surgery, the easier time that you're going to have on the back end of the surgery. Now, as always, if you have any questions or comments or if you have any requests for, for future videos, please leave us a comment in the comment sections. Uh, please remember to press the like button as it helps us with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, we really appreciate your support. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please consider doing so now. Okay, thank you very much.